when we read Colossians chapter 2, Paul is specifically under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, not addressing philosophy, but addressing the vain philosophies of the world. So that distinction must be made. There is divine philosophy. As I pointed out before, the primary work, literary work, literary treatise of divine philosophy is the book of Ecclesiastes. That's God's philosophy of life, Kohelet in Hebrew. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. It's in vain to trust in this life or this world. Love God and keep his commandments. If you want to understand the real philosophy of life and existence in a fallen world, read the book of Ecclesiastes. There are other things in scripture known as wisdom literature. Wisdom literature. Asifrut in, in, in the Hebrew canon, the wisdom literature is, this, is in its own ca category of the Old Testament called the katuvim, katuvim, the writings. So God has always had wisdom literature. He's always had in the Hebrew canon and in the way the Hebrew scriptures are organized, he always had philosophy, but it was not the philosophies of the world. Now concerning the philosophies of the world, what is the merit, if any, in understanding the philosophies of the world? the Aristotelian, the Platonic, or the Utilitarians, Beetham or Hobbes, or the 19th century German rationalists, Hegel or Nietzsche, or whoever. What is the purpose of understanding Schopenhauer or Spinoza? What's the purpose of understanding the philosophies of the world? Evangelism and apologetics. Unless you know what unsaved people believe, you will not know how to witness to them or present the gospel to them effectively and refute their argumentation. Remember, it is not likely that people who are consumed with human wisdom are going to get saved. Some do. Most will not. The philosophies of the world go hand in hand with an intellectual pride that is a barrier to belief in the gospel. That's a barrier to faith. However, such people have an influence sociologically and socio-psychologically on the world at large, on the general population, on the people we're trying to reach. They are being influenced by the philosophies of the world. The philosophies of the world, or the vain philosophies of the world, as Paul aptly describes them, always work in tandem with something called the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age which is right now New Age. And the philosophies to which people commonly subscribe are essentially of a New Age origin, but that's the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. Now, the spirit of the age is always controlled by the spirit of Antichrist, is always controlled by the spirit of Antichrist in the fallen world, always in some way. It's important to be able to understand these things, to explain them, to disciple young believers as to how to understand the world and how to witness to the unsaved, to understand the presuppositions. In my youth, the person who God most raised up to explain these things to people of my age group was Dr. Francis Schaeffer. He understood the worldview. He understood the zeitgeist. He understood what was happening, and he knew how to explain our faith to us in light of and in contrast to the mentality of the world and its vain philosophies, that was Francis Schaeffer. Paul was the same way. When he was at Athens debating the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill at the Areopagus, he took on the Areopagites, but he knew their worldview. He knew the philosophical presuppositions to which they subscribed that came from the Platonic and Aristotelian world and so forth. Paul understood these things. He understood the impact of people like C Cicero or, you know, um, De Clementia by Seneca and, and, and Cicero's Republic. The early Christian leaders understood these things. God raised up people specifically like Paul and Barnabas who knew these things. The value in understanding the philosophies of the world is an evangelism and apologetics. You have to understand the philosophy of Islam in order to effectively evangelize the Muslim world. You have to understand 
the philosophical presuppositions of communism in order to evangelize communists, where it came from, Hegelian dialectics. You have to understand it. Remember, Paul knew what the unsaved believed. He knew what the Greco-Roman world believed. He knew what the Sanhedrin and the rabbis believed. But he also knew the truth. We are not called to be naive as to the ways of the world. We are to be innocent, innocent as doves, but wise as serpents, shrewd like they are, shrewd like the devil. We're to know what they know. We are to understand why they think the way they do. Now, of course, not everybody is called to this to the same degree. Not everyone is called to academic theology or to being able to grapple with philosophical worldviews and things like this. But none of us is to be naive about it. And there are people who are going to be called to understand the philosophies of the world in order to teach it to the rest of the church so that we may evangelize more effectively. Even if the philosophers of the world themselves don't get saved, they are still affecting people who can get saved. This is the value. Again, be careful of an intellectual Christianity that results in a kind of spiritual pride. But be careful also of anti-intellectualism. It is also a spiritual pride. One is a pride based on superiority, and the other is a pride based on inferiority. Neither one are scriptural, neither one are right. We address this issue in some length in our teaching, The Holy Kiss, The Holy Kiss, which is available on YouTube and on Roku TV. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless. Blessings, dear friends. Greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon, and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, 
all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.